Hi friends, how's it going? Um, so it is the Women in Translation Readathon right now. I have been swamped at work and I haven't gotten to read anything yet. And it's like Wednesday. We're working on it. We're working on it. I promise. Um, but I did want to talk about one book that I have read and um, have feelings on. Okay, so you know I love <laughs> Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan Quartet. I'm, I'm a huge fan. I know a bunch of people think it's trash. It's fine. I will love it. You know, one man's trash is another's treasure. I don't know. Anyway, I, I just like her other novels. I haven't read her new one yet, just to answer that question. I did read, however, for <laughs> Women in Translation Month, I read Ele Elena Ferrante's um, Incidental Inventions. It's really, it's rough. So I wanted to read a section for you because I have feelings and because I think it's important to have this conversation um, and, and talk about ableism when I find it in books because I, I haven't really, uh, it's just a very emotional experience, but this one is really offensive and I, I just really wanted to talk about it so that we can say that, yes, Elena Ferrante writes great books in a lot of ways, but in other ways she's problematic and we should talk about that. So... On page 19, uh, in an essay called The End, because this is an essay collection, um, she says, she talks about her fear of illness. More and more often, I hear my friends say, it's not death that scares me, but illness. And she goes on to say, um, it's as if I were confessing that what truly worries me is the end of good health along with everything that that entails, debilitation, progressive inactivity, pleasure diminished to the simple assertion that I am still I and that for now, somehow or other, I am alive. As a result, the idea of death itself seems increasingly pallid. What is terrifying instead is the end of enjoyable life, of a full life. And for me, that's because the belief in some kind of beyond acquired during childhood has faded over time. Wait, that's irrelevant. Um, okay, let's. A, a lot of people argue with me about how I say that my life is equally as awesome, even with a disability. And one of the things that I really struggled with here is that. She's saying that the belief that a disabled life is not a full life and that is a, extremely problematic and is not okay. My life is equally as full as a disabled person, as an able-bodied person. It's just different and that's fine. And so while I love El Elena Ferrante's discussion of women's relationships, I think you can see the ableism that's in her texts and other places as well. I mean, you look at my brilliant friend and how there's a woman with mental illness that's deemed as crazy. Um, and unfortunately, there is like a doggy dot world in my brilliant friend with the type of um, poverty that the main characters live in. Um, but uh, this is this is a problem. And so I just wanted to mention that, that we can love an author, but still criticize them for their errors. I, I am not going to be able to read Elena Ferrante's novels again without this in mind, because the idea that one of her greatest fears is living a life like mine, you know, and I didn't come to this place from an able-bodied or non-disabled position. I was born this way and have always been sick, but it's really offensive to have someone say that my life isn't a full life or is worth living. One of the important things to remember is that a disabled life is still a life worth living. Unfortunately, a lot of people genuinely don't believe that. They like to pretend otherwise, but like, that's not what they write. That's not how they live. Uh, you have discussions around people and disabilities all the time. You have people during COVID saying that these, you know, high risk communities like older people and disabled people are worth sacrificing for the sake of our economy. You have all this stuff going down and I was hoping to be able to escape into this Women in Translation Month readathon and, and not have to really think about all of those things, but um, kind of ruin that, you know? So I don't 
really know where this is exactly going, but this is the first book that I finished for this readathon, and this is what happened, and I'm very sad about that. I, there are many essays in here I did enjoy, but it's kind of tainted now with knowing what she really feels about people like me, and that's really difficult to just get wrap your mind around, you know? So, um, yeah, that's book one, guys. I don't know. I don't know. Hello, friends. Welcome to the library. It's the next day. Um, so I am listening to, is it The Lying Life of Adults? I'll put the image right here. It's still in the background, per usual. Um, I just got back from a walk. I finished, actually, Zadie Smith's Intimations, which is not in translation, but it's a very short uh, little essay collection I would recommend. Um, but I am actually about 60% through The Lying Life of Adults by Elena Bronte. I really, I really love it. Like, this is the Ferrante I am obsessed with, or have been obsessed with. So, I really loved the Neapolitan series because it looks at working class people. It looks at the um, discussion of class. And, you know, what's interesting to me is that a lot of Americans try to either ignore the fact that class exists here in America um, as opposed to just rich people and poor people. The idea of class definitely exists, but also that people who are more solidly middle class um, or above will try to downplay the role that class plays in people's lives and how big of a deal class plays in literature. So coming from a working class background, um, I really related to a lot of how class played a role in my brilliant friend and the second novel in particular because you saw them as kids and trying to overcome that and uh, and different things. In this book class plays also a huge role as well. It's set in Naples again. Um, there is a protagonist who is I think 13 the beginning of the book and it's basically her experience with adults who are lying. She also lies a lot, but about really frivolous things with her friends. But her, she realizes pretty quickly that the adults around her are lying about certain things. What starts off the novel is that her parents say that she's getting the face like her Aunt Victoria. And she doesn't know Victoria. She doesn't know her Aunt Victoria. She only knows her as this hated aunt that her father really despises. He comes from a poor working class background and has really disassociated himself from his family and the stuff that they do. And so she doesn't really know her aunt. So now she's worried that she is hideous and she has this dying, like, like an urge, like this need, like this uh, insistence that she feels inside to go and see her aunt and to not just answer the question of whether or not she's ugly, but to know more about her family. And I find that fascinating. I love the way that Elena Ferrante writes the young people um, in her books. Uh, there's still some weird comments about uh, people with illness. Uh, for example, the protagonist has this fear of illness that um, you can see peppered throughout the novel. I don't know if that's intentional on Fronte's part or not, or if that's just a natural occurrence of non-disabled people. I mean, there is a general fear of that. So I don't know, but I find it fascinating. I love the in interior life of this protagonist. I am a really loving it. And I, man, it, it's such a complex feeling to have gone from her essays where I was really repulsed by her revealing her ableist feelings and ideas to going to this. Um, which, I mean, it's sort of like when I read Virginia Woolf and I fell in love with her and she is my favorite writer, but as I'm an adult, her pretty obvious flaws in regards to classism, um, 
uh, become a parent. And I think oftentimes people give Virginia Woolf too much credit in how open-minded she is. I, I don't think she's as open-minded as some people think she is. So, but I do think it is possible to hold those two things together, those contradictions simultaneously, that she is forward-thinking in some areas, but not, because that's how real life works. And I feel very similarly about Elena Ferrante. I mean, you could say stuff about Elena Ferrante's generation and whatever, but I think ultimately it's just going to show how few people actually think about uh, the serious nature of ableism in literature and how prevalent it is. And I think if I waited for a book that did not have any ableism in it at all, I would, I would very, I would read very few books, um, for sure. So it's an interesting, uh, thought process, an intellectual, like, practice experiment, I guess, maybe. Um, yeah, it's something I've been thinking about during this readathon. Anyway, I'm like 60% through, like I said, so at this point, we're like a few years into the timeline of the novel, stuff has gone down with the adults in her life, she's, you know, obviously met her Aunt Victoria, and all of these things are happening. Um, what's very interesting is just, I, I remember being curious the way that this protagonist is curious about wanting to know where, more about where I came from. And I'm still obsessed with genealogies and heritage and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, all of it's really fascinating. Also, you might have noticed this is my gamer chair. And I actually got it for the office because it has this pillow. And um, I need neck support um, for anywhere that I sit. So I was like, this is cool. So this is my office. So you normally see me sitting down over there, but um, anyway. All right, well, I will update you if I have another update about um, what's going on with the novel. Um, but yeah, I'll talk to you guys later. Hello, friends. Uh, so it is September 1st, so it's a couple of days later. And I want to talk a little bit about The Lying Life of Adults and I kind of wrap that up because I finished that yesterday before the end of the readathon. I was very proud. <laughs> uh, so I really loved the the book. I, I really loved Lying Life of Adults. In particular, the characters, there's no really plot to the book, but Elena Ferrante has this way of making small events in someone's life, like big events. The characters are so fascinating, so well-rounded, and if a character is flat, you know the book is flat, the book. You know the character is flat for a reason. There's just something about it um, that fascinates me about her characters. She also writes about class in a way that I rarely see here in America. You have a character whose father left a very poor working class neighborhood of Naples. They now live in a better part of town and he wants to distance himself from his uh, lower class past, as it were. There's also themes about academia and all sorts of things. So I did enjoy this book, um, but of course I was still thinking about the stuff that she had written earlier about... Um, you know, her fear of illness and like what that looked like and all of these different things. So I think it's important to talk about both the good and the bad with authors. I mean, obviously I'm still reading Elena Ferrante, but it's incredibly important that we understand that she will always come from this perspective that to be ill is to be something to be feared. You can see tiny notes of that in the novel, very little is discussed, and that's voiced by the narrator. So of course we cannot and should not assume that that voice of the narrator is the author's opinion because it's fiction and it's the narrator. I, I, we should, yeah, that's one of my reviewing pet peeves, sorry. It's people thinking that the voice of the protagonist is the voice of the author. No, stop, please. Anyway. <laughs> Avoiding that like tangent, um, I really enjoyed this book, would recommend, just heads up, think critically about it, it's really a fascinating read, I, yeah, there's just so much about this book that's really interesting, and I want to talk about the last scene with people, because I'm like, this is wild, because I'm not sure if I like how it ended, I don't know, I have so many questions, but so it was really an, an enjoyable book to listen to, and I listened to it in like two sittings. It was that good. So I would recommend overall. So we, I read two books for the readathon. One I finished early, um, 
which was the essay collection. And so, um, yeah, you've already seen my feelings about that. Uh, but uh, this one was was pretty good. So overall, a uh, decent readathon. I actually enjoyed a piece of Elena Ferrante's fiction for the first time in like years. So I mean, pretty much five years, actually, because that's the <laughs> It's how long it's been since the last book in the in Neapolitan Quartet came out. Uh, yeah. Also, I will say, like, her earlier novels are just so different than her later novels. Uh, most recent novels, maybe, is a better way to say that. So, I don't know. Tell me all of your Elena Ferrante thoughts down in the comments below. Is it really a wit readathon vlog from Kendra if there isn't a rant about Elena Ferrante? I'm just at least consistent. <laughs> All right, so that's it from me. Many thanks to Matthew and Jennifer, my uh, co-conspirators for this readathon. Um, thank you all so much for joining, and I will link any wrap-ups from them down in the show notes below, description box, whatever platform we're on, and I'll talk to you guys later. All right, bye.